Our Father God, we praise you that you are a speaking God, that you've not left us to guess what you're like, but you've spoken and revealed yourself to us. And we thank you that you've had your words written down. And we pray that you'd speak to us now through these words in Exodus. Amen. Can I ask you to imagine what you think it would be like to have been a Christian on the first Easter Sunday? So you've just seen Jesus risen from the dead, the visible evidence, if you like, of the powerful rescuing God. What kind of Christian do you think you would be on a day like that? I think we'd find it, wouldn't we, easier to believe that God keeps his promises if we've just seen the risen Jesus? I suspect we'd find it easier to live for Jesus. I would like, I think, to live my whole Christian life on the first Easter Sunday, as if that were possible. I'd like to be able to get out every morning, get up every morning and um, put my coffee on and then head into the garden where I've got the Jerusalem tomb. And just as I get there every morning, Jesus walks out, risen from the dead in great power, a great visible display of God's awesome strength right in front of me and I guarantee if that happened I think I would find it easier to live as a Christian that day if that were my morning routine if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian then maybe you'd say that that kind of thing is what would make you one seeing obvious visible evidence of God at work but instead what we get to look at in the world around us is God's church I suppose which let's be honest looks very weak doesn't it And the saviour that Christians trust in and tell everyone about is a person who lived 2,000 years ago and who most of 21st century Britain has no interest in. How can we live as Christians when what we see in the world makes God look weak and not strong? Our Bible reading from Exodus is a good place to ask that question. The Bible is one big continuous story that starts at the beginning of Genesis with the God who made everything. And with humans who turned our backs on God, we turned from goodness to evil, from the God of life to death. And the whole story of the Bible is that God loves us and wants us back. If you open the Bible anywhere and look for what God is doing, you'll find him freeing people from slavery to sin and death so that they can have life with him. You'll find him saying to the world, I want you back. And the story of Exodus is just a mini version of that cosmic plan. God is setting people free to live with him. Later in the book, we get to hear God himself saying that's exactly what he's doing. Exodus 29 verse 46 says this, I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. That's where we're getting to, but here at the beginning of the book, Exodus picks up right where the book of Genesis finished. Jacob's sons and their families, do you remember if you've been with us over the last few months when we were in Genesis, they've moved to Egypt where Joseph of Technicolor Dreamcoat fame was made prime minister. And they're a family carrying extraordinary promises from God. God had promised Abraham and his family a whole nation of descendants that would become more numerous than the stars in the sky. He promised them the land of Canaan that would become known as Israel, the promised land. And he promised eventually a global salvation plan through Abraham's family. And those promises to Abraham kicked off God's attempt to call people back to him. And as chapter one begins, things seem to be going okay as Exodus starts. Let me read from verse six. Look down at verse six if you've got it open. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Sure, they're in Egypt, aren't they? Not the promised land, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly. They're heading in the right direction for being as numerous as the stars in the sky. Israelite population is booming. But things begin to go badly wrong, don't they, in verse 8. Then a new king who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. Come, we must 
deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So God is supposed to be calling people back to him to live with him, but he's got a rival. The king of Egypt, he wants the Israelites for himself. He's threatened by them, but his economic plans depend on them. And so the Egyptians enslave the Israelites and set them to build store cities and work in the fields. It's a life of slave masters and forced labor. The Egyptians are ruthless and slavery to them is miserable. God's people are enslaved by the world's superpower of the day. Their situation looks ever so weak, doesn't it? God's promises and power seem insignificant. And yet, verse 12, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So at least this bit of God's promise still seems to be going forward. Abraham's family is growing. But Pharaoh's not finished with them yet. Verse 16, he commands that all newborn Israelite boys be killed by the midwives that deliver them. It's a horrifying policy designed to keep Israel subdued under Egyptian control and power. But Pharaoh's plan doesn't work. Verse 20, the people increased and became even more numerous. How? Well, because of two astonishing women. Did you see them? Shifra and Pua, the Israelite midwives, who flat out disobey the king of Egypt. Just think for a moment that of the power that those two women are up against. Pharaoh, I suppose, is the equivalent of someone like the president of Russia, but without any UN or any other world superpowers trying to restrain them. Shifra and Pua, on the other hand, are just two NHS staff. Why have you let the boys live, Pharaoh demands. And we're told the answer to that in verse 17. It seems strange that they go against Pharaoh. What makes them willing to risk so much by defying him? Well, they feared God. We're told Shifra and Pua, fear God. Now, we tend to use the language of fear, don't we, as a negative thing. It's usually miserable to be afraid. But the Bible uses fear in a way bigger, a much bigger way than that. To fear someone is, I think, to recognize that they are the one with the power. Like uh, a boss at work, our boss's opinions and wishes carry a different weight, don't they, to our colleagues, because our boss is in charge. To fear God is to recognize his power, to recognize that he's the one ruling the universe. That's why you'll find in another bit of the Bible, one of the reasons to fear God is that he forgives It's great that God forgives, so this isn't a miserable fear. It's a recognition that forgiveness is only God's job because he's the one in charge. The midwives know that God is in charge. They fear God. So they disobey Pharaoh and they let the boys live. And they make up a hilarious excuse about Israelite women being super quick to give birth. I'm sorry, Pharaoh. Labor only lasted five minutes. We got there and the baby had gone. It's worth saying that Exodus isn't trying to teach us that it's sometimes okay to lie. It's not the lying of the midwives that they're commended for. It's that when it came to choosing between God's side and Pharaoh's side, they chose God's. Pharaoh says, you're under my power. And even though they can see Pharaoh's power all around them, in his palace, in his servants, in his mammoth army, they know that all that power that they can see is nothing compared to God's power. Absolutely nothing. They know that any power that opposes God will ultimately find itself on the losing side. I think that's the great lesson of chapter one, that the greatest power in the world set against God's people with horrifying determination loses. God will overcome overcome all opposition to his promises. That means that though God's people looked weak, in reality, nothing could stop them growing. We can have a similar kind of confidence today. Nothing can stop God from keeping his promises. God's people today is everyone who believes in Jesus. And all the power in the world cannot stop the growth of God's people. That doesn't necessarily mean that the church in Britain won't die out. God can do what he likes. And if any particular church gives up on God and deserts him, we've no promise that God will keep us alive. 
But opposition to God won't halt the church's growth. Whatever happens, God will keep on saving people, more and more people. That's not how I normally think. Is it how you think? I sometimes think, how on earth will the church ever grow? Think about what the church is up against. We are not a particularly impressive bunch of people, are we? And many of our friends haven't the slightest bit of interest in God. In our country, to be Christian used to be respectable and sensible, and then Christians became kind of quaint and maybe slightly laughable, and now it looks like our beliefs are starting to be seen as intolerant and possibly harmful. And we've got it easy in Britain. In some parts of the world, to become a Christian is to face the death penalty. How does Exodus help us live as Christians when God's church looks, humanly speaking, very weak? Well, it gives us a chance to look at what happens when all the power in the world goes up against God's promises. Nothing can stop the church growing. So we don't need to fear our country becoming less Christian. We don't need to fear future governments passing laws to make evangelism more difficult. That never stopped the gospel in the past and it won't in the future. We don't need to fear the media becoming less tolerant of Christian views. We don't need to fear when so-called Christian churches seem to have forgotten the gospel of God. That won't stop God's promises. God might not look like the great power, but those Israelite midwives were exactly right, weren't they, that he is. God has promised to keep saving people, and so he will. Of course, God had also promised the Israelites that he'd set them free to live in the promised land. And by the end of Exodus 1, that promise is looking weaker than ever isn't it we've seen I think in chapter one the weakness of God's people the church and we're about to see the weakness of God's rescue Pharaoh does not give up after the midwife fiasco instead he goes public and enlists the help of the whole Egyptian people in his genocide every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile can you imagine what it must have been like to be an Israelite in those days seeing countless sons drowned. What must it have felt like to be a pregnant Israelite? Desperately hoping for a baby girl, I expect, and then giving birth to a son and being powerless to protect him from what was coming. In a world of such suffering, where is this God of supposed power? Where are the angel armies swooping down to rescue boys from the river? Why doesn't God open up the ground and swallow Pharaoh? Why doesn't God send a rescue? And then chapter 2 zooms in on one particular family, two unidentified Levites who give birth to a son. The mother hides him, doesn't she, for as long as she can until the risk of discovery becomes so great that utterly desperate measures are called for. She puts the three-month-old child in a waterproof Moses basket and places it in the water among the reeds at the edge of the Nile in a spot where we discover Pharaoh's daughter likes to wash. She sees the basket. She sends someone to fetch the basket, opens it, and faced with a crying Israelite boy, feels sorry for him. At which point the baby's older sister, watching from a distance, steps forward and makes a suggestion That means by the end of the day, the baby is back with his own mother and safe from Pharaoh because Pharaoh's own daughter is paying the baby's own mother to nurse that child. In verse 1, this baby was facing murder. By verse 10, he's been adopted into Pharaoh's family. And then the punchline comes, doesn't it? This unidentified child isn't just some randomer. This is Moses the one God is going to use to rescue his people from Egypt. It it adds a whole other perspective to what's just happened. This rescue of the baby by Pharaoh's daughter will turn out to be God's beautiful undoing of Pharaoh's wicked plan. Why won't God rescue his people from Egyptian tyranny? He will. Not with trumpet blasts from heaven and great visible displays of power, not yet anyway, 
It's the same pattern we see throughout the Bible. God loves to humble the human race, to shame our ideas of power by hiding his power right in the middle of human weakness. That baby in the basket, picture it, sitting in the reeds, probably about to be murdered. Humanly speaking, it has such a fragile existence, helpless under Pharaoh's power, that God's powerful rescue is hidden right there in that basket in human weakness. There's more weakness to come as the story goes on. Maybe we'd expect Moses to grow up as part of Pharaoh's household until perhaps eventually he becomes the next Pharaoh. And with all the power of Egypt in his hands can rescue God's people that way. Except that's not at all what happens. As a grown man, Moses does try to step in as rescuer. Chapter 2, verse 11, he's a prince in Pharaoh's household, but he goes to where his own people are. It must have been painful, I expect, for him to see their deep suffering. When he sees a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian, he will not stand for it. He steps in and strikes the Egyptian, killing him. It's a risk, but surely his people will be grateful, won't they? They'll keep it secret and keep him safe from Pharaoh. But the next day, when Moses tries to reconcile two fighting Israelites, he is not welcomed with open arms as the rescuer. Far from it. If you were with us just a few weeks ago, you might remember how Stephen described this episode in Acts chapter 7. He says that Moses thought that his own people would recognize that God was using him to rescue them. But they did not. Instead, they rejected him with the words, who made you ruler and judge? And so Moses has to flee Egypt when Pharaoh finds out what he did. So off he goes, rejected by his people. He is an unrecognized rescuer. The only people in this story who welcome a rescue from Moses are the Midianite shepherdesses, aren't they? He ends up living with that family, marrying one of them, Zipporah, and giving their son the poignant name Gershom. I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. It looks, I think, like a disaster for Israel. They have missed their rescuer. And so, verse 23, God's people remain in slavery for a long period. No rescue, only more groaning. And yet, verse 24, we're told, God, our wonderful God, remembered his covenant promises. That is, he hasn't forgotten his plan to set his people free to live with him. He's about to act. How will he do it? How is God going to bring about this promised rescue? As we work through Exodus in the coming weeks, we will see God save with great power. And yet he'll do it using Moses this weak rescuer whose existence hung in the balance while he lay in that basket on the Nile, this rejected rescuer, unrecognized by the people God intended him to save. You see, the Exodus story is just a part of Israel's history where God acts out a mini version of his ultimate rescue plan. Humans have turned from God and we're enslaved to sin and death and God wants us back. He loves us, and he wants us to have life with him. And just as through Moses then, God saves through a saviour who looks weak and ends up being rejected by his own people. Jesus Christ looks weak to most of our friends and neighbours, doesn't he? If there's a God and he wants us back, surely he would do something visibly powerful. Surely he'd make his salvation visible to all, unmissable. No wonder our friends don't believe. God's salvation seems so small. A man who lived 2,000 years ago and was killed. But you see, God doesn't make his salvation obviously and visibly powerful. Occasionally he does. We'll see some of that in the rest of Exodus. And the great example is Jesus' resurrection, isn't it? And those moments do teach us God's infinite power to save. But normally, God deliberately hides his power in human weakness. Though the crucified Jesus looks a weak and rejected saviour, he's actually the power and wisdom of God. That's an encouragement, isn't it? To, to keep sharing Jesus with our friends, however weak the good news seems. The weak, rejected saviour is God's salvation. Thousands of people are being saved by Jesus every day. 
We live in a time when both God's church and God's rescuer look weak. I do not get to live every, life, every day of my life on the first Easter Sunday. I don't get before breakfast the visible display of God's power that I might want. And so sometimes God's promises don't seem so real as the things in the world around me. And these chapters help me to open my eyes. The God who kept his promises while his people were enslaved and his rescuer rejected is the same God at work in our lives now. The invitation of this bit of Exodus is for us, I think, to follow the example of Shifra and Pua. To know that God is in charge even when it doesn't look like it. Fear God, trust God, even when his power is hidden. In your workplace or wherever you are this week, it is utterly true that nothing can stop God saving people through Jesus, his powerful saviour. God knows who he intends to save around Carlisle, doesn't he? As we go about our lives living and speaking for Jesus, looking weak and foolish probably, there is no power that can stop God saving people through Jesus. So if I learn the lesson of Exodus 1 and 2, and if I learn to fear God when his power is hidden, then every day can feel like Easter Sunday. What will I think when I see the apparent weakness of the church and the apparent weakness of God's saviour? I can remember that God is at work, his power hidden in weakness, setting people free to live with him. Let's pray together. Father God, please give us the faith of those Hebrew midwives to know your promise-keeping power, even when it's hidden in weakness. Amen.